What you'll be eating in Ecuador is rice. I hope you love rice because you'll eat it every single day, literally every single day. There'll be a few days maybe where you don't eat it, but every day you will eat rice. And when you get home, you'll actually miss the rice, which will surprise you because you didn't think you were ever going to miss rice again. But rice fills you up really well. You eat like a big meal at lunch and that's darn near it. They have really tiny breakfasts and really tiny dinners. It's mostly just a giant meal of rice at lunch. With the rice they have this thing called menestra which is uh, lentils and for me it was just a type of lentils that had absolutely no flavor and they say that it's there to wet the rice so just kind of put on the rice and it does wet the rice but it doesn't do anything else it just uh, didn't have much flavor but it's healthy and it's hard to get sick on that so that's nice and uh, usually you have chicken the chicken for me was the best part of the the meal you just got to roll it in the rice and flavor up your rice and it was nice but that's uh, that's the most typical meal in Guayaquil and most of Ecuador is chicken rice and menestra or lentils in Ecuador, in, in Guayaquil especially, on Saturdays for some reason, they all have this thing called encebollado. They all go to, it's kind of a soup, and it means kind of, the name kind of implies like onions, so it has a lot of onions in it, and it's just kind of this soup that they eat with plantain, fried plantain chips, and it's a breakfast food for them. And you'll have that. A lot of missionaries like that. I didn't particularly like it when I was there. But a lot of missionaries love it. The thing that I loved the most was called ceviche. And that's really hard to describe. You should probably go look it up because it's it's kind of a soupy dish, but it's not a soup. It's cold and it's kind of a raw seafood type dish. My favorite was called ceviche mixto. And that had octopus, squid, shrimp, fish, like all of it in it. And I thought it was delicious because the seafood there is really fresh. So it's really tasty seafood. And turns out octopus and squid are also really tasty. I've never had them before, but they are very, very tasty. And uh, you also eat that with the, the plantain chips or popcorn and you can put it over rice and it's uh, it's very tasty. I loved that. But that's, you'll mostly be eating just kind of simple meals. Outside of Guayaquil, you tend to eat more fish instead of chicken which can be nice to shake things up. But that's essentially what you'll be eating every day is just kind of a, a variant of rice, chicken, and lentils. My favorite juice is pineapple juice. What you do is you get pineapple and you blend it up and you pour it in, mix it with some, yeah, don't even mix it with some water. Uh, you can put in some extract of vanilla and sugar. And that's the best juice I've ever had in my entire life. And it's absolutely amazing. They also have this thing called tomate de arbol, like tree tomatoes. And that kind of grows on you. Like you start drinking it and it's not very good. But then later in your mission, you'll like have some at the dinner table and you'll be like, yes, this is delicious. And you'll just guzzle it down. They also have this thing called pony malta, which is kind of a, it's a malt drink. It's made by the beer company there. And it's, uh, it's non-alcoholic, but supposedly it tastes kind of like beer, but better. And I recommend drinking that because it's gross, but it's also like you find yourself craving it later on the more you have it. So it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a very satis it's, it's a very satisfactory drink. Like we, I remember one time we had a service project and then it's like, let's go get some Pony Malta. Yeah. And we drank it and ah, oh, it's good stuff, <laughs> except it's really, yeah. So it's just a lot of fun, different things to try down there. I really like history, and there were some things that confused me about Ecuador. For example, one of them is when you go there, it seems like every month or every other month there's a different Independence Day, which is really weird for us because there's like the 4th of July and that's it. But in Ecuador, what happened is when they declared independence from Spain, it was kind of a city by city, province by province movement. And so you have different holidays like the 10th of August, and a whole bunch of other dates that are Independence Days. And usually what it refers to is either the province's Independence Day or the town's Independence Day, when the town, like, united to the independence movement. So you have a lot of different Independence Days like that. The country, I think it has kind of two. There's, like, when it sort of declared independence, and then the Battle of Pinchincha when it won independence from Spain. So that was kind of confusing, and it took me a while to figure that out. Also, um, after that, Ecuador has had 26 constitutions, I believe, so it's had a lot of political ups and downs in its, in its time. But um, essentially, 
the the way Ecuador is is in the mountains there was a lot more Spanish blood and the Spaniards even after um, independence the people of Spanish blood were still kind of the aristocracy and it wasn't until Loyal Faro you'll hear about him when you're down there it wasn't until he came along that things start, kind of started changing and he was actually quite unpopular for that within the richer circles but he built the railroad that connected the coast to the mountains and he was he, he created a lot of education programs and this was about 1810 around there and um, he really he really advanced the country forward quite a lot in a lot of different respects and eventually though he was uh, he was killed in a very very brutal manner if you're ever serving in the town of Manta you should go to Monte Cristi and visit his mausoleum that's there. There's a museum and a mausoleum, and it's actually kind of cool to go visit there. And you can get a little book that talks all about him and the nasty, nasty way that they killed him. So that's kind of just a brief history of Ecuador. Like the president there, he's, uh, he's done a lot for the country, actually. President Correa, he's done a lot of infrastructure type things, and that's kind of how to be popular in a Latin American country, is just kind of advance the infrastructure of the country and things like that. But the country is in a lot of debt, and there's the gas gas prices are down right now, so there's a lot of problems with that, because one of their biggest export is gasoline, or oil, I guess. And um, he's a pretty popular president, and that's kind of a problem, just because he's looking at a way to make it so he can be the president indefinitely and he's not bound by the number of terms and so there's like kind of and the opposition it's a multi-party system in ecuador and there's way too many parties and they're not very effective at any sort of opposition movement most of the legislature is the president's party and the rest of the legislature is just a splinter group of tons of small parties that can't really agree with each other. So, If there is an animal control in Ecuador, I am unaware of it because there are just dogs everywhere. Especially on the coast, there's just dogs in the streets, dogs everywhere. The dogs will bark at you. They don't bite very often. I've never, I never actually... I heard of some people getting bitten, but they were in different parts, like in Peru and things like that, or members that got bitten. But you don't ever really hear about missionaries getting bit by dogs. Their, their bark is worse than their bite, as they say. But they do get really annoying. They will get really close to you and kind of freak you out. So what you do is you bend over and pick up a rock. And usually you don't even have to actually pick up a rock. You just bend over and pretend to pick one up and the dogs run away. And I don't know why exactly that is. I, it, I, I kind of wonder if it's in their collective memory or if just every single dog's been hit by rocks so often that they know what that means. <laughs> but um, actually, what I would recommend for everybody going to Ecuador, there was an elder or two, and they had these dog whistle things that, like, scare dogs away. Like, humans can't hear them, but you press the button, and the dogs freak out and run away. I really wanted one of those. That would be absolutely incredible. Just pull that out, and the dogs would leave you alone. That's So if you can find one of those and get one before your mission, that would be fantastic. First off, uh... Ecuadorian Spanish, it's actually pretty nice. It's a fairly easy to understand dialect. Although in Guayaquil, you do get some people who just speak callejero, like it's just street Spanish and it's way hard to understand what they are saying. I started my mission in the mountains and I remember they speak very clearly and kind of sing songy up there. And I remember meeting some people from Guayaquil and it's like, what are you saying? And why is all, why are all of your words thrown together? But uh, you get used to it and it's actually not that difficult. They do have some slang words there that are important to know. Uh, one of them is pelucon, means rich. Normally you would say rico for rich, but in Ecuador you say pelucon. And I think that actually comes from the, the president coined that term. And he was kind of criticizing rich people. And pelucon, it means kind of like really hairy. And he used it meaning like wigs, like old-fashioned rich people who wear wigs. And so that's why they all say that there. They also say aniñado, which kind of took a while to get the pronunciation down. They also say uh, bacan and chévere. Chévere is the most common way to say cool, so that's an important word. But you'll just go on picking up different slang words kind of as you um, as you learn. There's, there's a variety and I was learning them my entire mission, but those are probably the most important words. You also say plata instead of, instead of dinero, like silver instead of money. So in Ecuador they actually, surprise surprise, they use the American dollar. So I was actually kind of disappointed by that because I wanted to use like a different currency, just kind of fun. But they use American dollar there. They used to have this. Uh, they used to have what's called the sucre, 
And if you're lucky, you'll still be able to find some of those and maybe take some home. I was not. The only ones I ever saw were actually glued into concrete walls as decorations. <laughs> and uh, But um, the Sucre kind of hit rock bottom. It was like 25000 for $1. And so they just switched, and now they use the American dollar. The cost of living, it's it's pretty similar, kind of. Like, buying food is generally cheaper, but anything that's imported is about the same price. So, your peanut butter, which you can get, which is nice. There's, you can get most things from America that are American there in the supermarkets, and it's about the same price. But, like, food on the street is definitely cheaper. You can get, like, 12 or more mangoes for, like, a dollar and I feel like I'm saying that wrong you might be able to get that for 10 cents I don't know I remember getting sleeves of mandarin oranges for like 25 cents I think it's just ridiculously cheap and during the fruit seasons that they have down there they'll just be vendors all over the place selling them and the fruit is fantastic there it is absolutely incredible I, you've never had a banana until you go to Ecuador which export it's the largest exporter of bananas and the fruits are ugh, just fantastic, I'm sorry. Also, the fruit juices that they make there, they are the best fruit juices ever. I, like, punch, like, Kool-Aid and stuff. It's just so nasty compared to, like, real fruit juice. They just do a fantastic job of making it down there. So that was wonderful. Uh, as far as, like, housing prices and stuff, actually... It's kind of similar to Provo. <laughs> I remember a lot of rent for a lot of these places we were staying in. It was two, three hundred dollars a month. So you definitely get a better deal here in Provo than you do down there because the the houses aren't as nice. But um, so the cost of living is generally about the same. Clothes tend to cost more. And shoes, if you're an American elder and you have, like, shoes that are bigger than, like, a le size 11 or bigger, they don't have shoes for you down there. So you need to, like, order some. So I just, you just need to get three really good pairs of shoes. Be sure to do that. And um, you don't really want to buy very many clothes down there because they tend to be expensive. Unless you go to one of the, the flea markets. You can get soccer jerseys down there that are actually pretty nice if you look around and you can you can haggle them down to five bucks. So you can get away with some really sweet deals down there. It just it kind of depends. Like you've got things that are more expensive and less expensive. Usually the less legit of a shop it is, the less expensive it is. <clears throat> if you go shopping at like their equivalents of Walmart, though, it's like just as expensive or more expensive. So Transportation is actually super cheap down there. It's way nice. Every bus pretty much in Ecuador, darn near every bus, is 25 cents. So it's way cheap. And you ride the bus as long as you want. So that doesn't cost hardly anything. Uh, taxi prices are different. In Guayaquil, it starts off at 150 which I remember when I got there, that was the second place I served. When I got there, I thought that was outrageous because a lot of other towns, it's just $1 for a taxi ride. And you can get pretty long taxi rides for a dollar. So it's actually like robbery. And I don't really know how the taxi drivers make any money doing that. I guess ja gas is a little cheaper down there because they export a lot of gas, but still. So you get that for really cheap. Uh, but a word of caution is that the taxi drivers down there, they are out there to get you. So you need to be sure to argue with them about the price and like you can get it down a lot i remember sometimes like oh goodness there you have some really great success stories about ha of haggling down there like getting it down from a seven dollar ride to like a two dollar ride but especially since if you're a white missionary then they they see that and they automatically jack up the price a whole bunch but if you start talking to them in spanish and be like hey i live here man i know what this is and if you have a latino companion which you probably will then you can get it down to the normal price but same thing goes for buying souvenirs or anything generally a souvenir is marked up ten dollars because you're white an easy way to do it is just kind of pick out what you want and then go have your companion who's a latino go and buy it for you and they'll get a way better price than you can even haggling. So um, inner city buses, they're also very cheap. You can usually get a refund from the mission office for inner city travel, but it's uh, it's actually very cheap. It's just a few dollars to go 10 hours on a bus. So it's very nice. If you're ever thinking about traveling there, it's, it's very cheap, as long as you're comfortable with taking public transportation, of course. I was kind of lucky. I got a visit 
darn near everywhere in Guayaquil. It's not actually a huge tourist attraction. If you read tourist guides about Ecuador, they generally tell you to not go to Guayaquil. <laughs> it's more of an industrious city than anything. The tourist centers are in other parts of the country, but there are some cool things. While you're there, you definitely have to go to La Parque de las Iguanas, the Iguana Park. And that's just what it sounds like. It's a park in the middle of the city, kind of a central square. There's a cathedral right there. And it's filled with iguanas. There's lots and lots of iguanas and pigeons. There's also pigeons, but they're not as cool. So the iguanas just kind of have free range around the park, and you just sit there and watch them. What you should do, though, this is what I did. You go and you buy some fruit from one of the vendors. And I'd, I recommend banana. Their favorite is banana. They eat up bananas like nobody's business. They'll just start following you around if you have a banana in your hand. What you can do, though, is you go sit on a bench somewhere and open up your banana and break off bits of it and just kind of put it like on your shoulders or your knees or your head. And the iguanas will come up and they'll climb up on your bench and they'll climb up onto you and eat the banana from off of you. And it's kind of a cool experience. Like... It, feel, it doesn't hurt, like, they kind of scratch a little bit, but it's just really cool. And everybody will start taking videos of you and, like, pictures and photos and stuff, and they'll all clap when you're done. So if you like attention, it's good, too. And, hey, you're a missionary, so maybe you could turn that to your advantage. I don't know. Actually, I had some tourists think they thought I was, like, a park ranger. So I got to explain to them that, no, I'm not a park ranger. I'm actually a missionary. So that's a, that's a very fun thing to do. One elder, I saw a photo of one of my zone leaders. He had a piece of banana on his tongue and the iguana was about to eat it. I didn't do that, and you could do it if you want to, I guess, but that, that, that's pretty gutsy. So, but the iguanas are, are very friendly, just, just like the people. So um, you have that. There's also a lighthouse that's fun to go visit, and several museums. So transportation in Guayaquil. <sighs> I, don't, I didn't like it very much. For a lot of my mission, actually, I was lucky enough to use taxis, and that's the way to get around is taxi drivers. Some of the taxi drivers are absolutely crazy, and you hear this about pretty much everywhere outside of America, but there was a few times I was scared for my life, but most of the time it's, it's pretty chill. It seems like the, the morning rush hour starts right when you, like, starts pretty early and gets over just in time for the lunch rush hour, which gets over just in time for the evening rush hour. So it feels like it's always rush hour, <laughs> and that can be frustrating. But mostly what you do is you go around on buses, just regular city transportation buses. And most of the buses are, are just fine. They're big and they have space. But usually the buses are very, very crowded. And there are a lot of buses that are also very, very tiny. I always used to say that if I die and I don't go to heaven, I will be stuck on bus number 12 for the rest of my life. That was a terrible bus for me because I'm very tall and the bus is not very tall. <laughs> I could only, the best I could do was about like this. And usually that bus was just incredibly jam packed all the time and it played music that was very strange for me and it was just terribly, terribly hot. And you're just careening down those streets back and forth through traffic and knocking into people. It was not a fun experience and I had the wonderful opportunity to take that bus almost every day for about nine months <laughs> so that was that was an adventure they also have something called the Metro which is basically just a bigger better two buses connected together and it has like its own special lane usually so it can get around the town faster and they you go to the stations where they they come by and they come by every minute or so and they're also very, very jam-packed, and always, essentially. And so that's always kind of a fun way to get around as well, if you like being crowded into them. These sound like kind of like not-so-fun things, but for some reason, it's, it's awesome at the same time, just getting to experience it and live a different lifestyle. So that's how you, that's how you get around in, in Guayaquil. Housing, there's, um, we live in pretty much the same houses as everybody else. A long time ago in Ecuador, they used to all live in kind of wood houses, like bamboo houses essentially. But in the last 20 years, they've really developed a lot. And now they've upgraded to concrete houses mostly. Mostly. And um, usually as, a, as missionaries, we live in concrete houses. And they can vary on how nice they are. Back in 2013, when the mission split, we got a new mission president. And before then, the houses were all very 
bad. <laughs> there was one elder, I remember he, um, <clears throat> when he left after his mission, he, he finished his mission and left. And the new elder went to that house and calls the mission president up and says, President, we don't have a roof. <laughs> There was a big hole in the roof that the the landlord had made, and they had tried to get him to fix it, but he couldn't. There was wooden or something, and so there was no. There was just a big section where there was no no roof, and they had the missionaries hadn't said anything to the president, which kind of talks about how bad the houses were back then. But luckily, um, the new mission president came and said that was that was no good. We need the spirit in the houses, and so the houses. Mostly got all switched, and they all got new furniture and new mattresses and things. So right now is a great time to serve because the the housing has been upgraded. But um, but you'll still have some housing adventures. I had one house, and it was called La Cueva de Castigo, which means the Cave of Punishment. And it didn't have any windows, and it was dark and dank in there, and it had been cleaned, maybe, maybe. <laughs> and uh, when I got there, there was just thousands of cockroaches, and I killed thousands and thousands of those things with a can of raid. I'm surprised we all didn't, that we didn't like start growing third arms because of all the raid fumes. But that was that was one of the old houses. The newer houses, they're all they're all pretty decent. So you usually have an electric stove to cook with, and you've got a microwave, which I think is the coolest thing ever because we didn't have those before. Unfortunately, though, you'll serve your entire mission with cold water showers, and I'd like to say you get used to it, but you never really do. The best you can do is when you come home very sweaty one day, and it feels nice to run it, rinse it all off with cold water. That's as good as it gets, but showering in the morning, I, I never enjoyed that very much. It's kind of it's kind of funny, actually. You spend like more time getting psyched up to go into the shower than you actually do in the shower itself. So that's, that's always a fun experience, but the members in their houses, they, they have some very humble circumstances. A lot of their houses are constructed with cinder blocks and they're just kind of mishappenly put together. They'll have a concrete floor maybe, like a lot of them have concrete floors, but there's no like tile or anything and it's not necessarily finished. A lot of them have dirt floors. You'll see a lot of variation, but a lot of, a lot of poor circumstances and but the members are just the nicest people ever. On the coast, they're even better. Like the people there are just amazing. They're just really easy to make friends with. It, I was absolutely amazed at how quickly you can just talk about very intimate things with people. They're just a very open, very loving, very friendly people. It just feels so nice to be able to communicate with people so freely down there. They're, it's really a, a special place. Chévere pues, yo estoy bien agradecido por el tiempo que, que disfruté en, en Ecuador y todas las personas que conocí allá, realmente ellos cambiaron mi vida al conocerlos a ellos. Estoy agradecido por la oportunidad de servir al Señor y conocer a las personas de, de Ecuador.